And now we are going to conclude the book of Titus, our three-week series, taking a look at this wonderful book written by the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote like two-thirds of our New Testament. And he's writing a letter to a young pastor in Crete named Titus. And Paul had started up, helped Titus start up some churches in this area. And now Paul's saying, okay, look, we've started this thing, but now we need to keep these churches healthy. And the way to keep these churches healthy is to put good, healthy leadership over each one of them. The qualification can't just be, I'll be a leader. He's like, no, 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 no. Let's actually make sure that we have some good leaders. And so as we went over the first couple of chapters, Paul gets kind of direct and, and halftime coaching. He's like, all right, look, I'm going to be direct here. I'm going to tell you what needs to be done and, and the types of leaders that we need to find. And he's not unkind, but he's to the point. And he calls it like it is. And he tells Titus, he's like, make sure that these people you put as, as leaders, that they're good that they're good uh, people who live above reproach. And people can't really blame them for much. They just, they're just good guys. They're good husbands, fathers. They have good kids. That All the followers, men and women, that they're people who don't get drunk. They're not mean or angry or violent. Make sure your leaders instead are hospitable. They're just nice. They're self-controlled. They're upright. You can't describe every bit of their being, but when you see a good person, you just know it. They, they love to do what is good. Make sure those are the people you're putting in leadership. And it bears out a little bit today because I know a lot of people in leadership and especially in churches is like he or she should be a leader because they speak really well. That's not the only qualifier. You could speak really well and be a complete jerk. So Paul lays it out like it is. He's like they need to be living out these ways. And the truth is a lot of Christians and even non-Christians, they sort of stop here with the list. They look at the list on how we should be living, and they're like, great, great book. But the problem is, if you ask the average non-believer, and even a lot of believers, like, what is the point of following Jesus? Like, what's the point of following Jesus? And even right now, if I put you on stage, and I said, what's the point of following Jesus? There's a part of you that's like, I think I know, but I don't want to answer that. It can make us kind of nervous. And the truth is, when I ask that of people, the most common answers I kind of get are, well, to live a better life to give you a purpose. I'm like, really, what's the purpose? To have a purpose. And it's like, it's like that cir circular logic thing. And I'll he hear other things like, well, to heal you, to give you your best life, to experience miracles in your relationships, to fulfill you. And these sound like beautiful answers, but the problem is these answers aren't in Scripture. We're just kind of winging it or making it up. These things all kind of read, if we're being honest, a bit more like a genie in the bottle. I want better relationships and, and my life to be organized and for me to be in control. They're kind of wishful thinking. And many of them often are, what can God do for me? And it makes God's story our story. And that's not the way that it's supposed to go. Because in reality, all of this, all of creation is God's wonderful story. He's the center. Jesus is the center of his story. His story of redemption and forgiveness. And we get to be a part of his story. And Paul even tells us in chapter 1 to encourage, to encourage believers to be and have sound doctrine. Make sure they understand this truth so that they can encourage people with it and they can refute people when they're not saying these things. Paul writes like, over and over and over again to do this, to be the people that God calls you to be so that, and he keeps using this phrase, be who God calls you to be so that, meaning there's a reason for it that comes after being a Christ follower, so that in order to accomplish something else. And that is now to be part of God's plan. We get to be the part of God's plan to spread the good news of his love and his son to this world. To do good, to be eager to do good is what Paul says. And our theme for Titus thus far up to this point is that we're rooted in Jesus. Now we have grace in us to produce good through us. That's the story. That's the theme of Titus. That's Titus 1 and 2 in a nutshell. For followers to be who they're called to be, to be new creations, given a new purpose, a new way of living, filled with grace to do good so that others can experience God's grace and do good. And the cycle continues. So let's jump in and see how Paul, he rounds out this last chapter of the book of Titus, chapter 3, and tells Titus what to tell his people and how people are supposed to follow God. Titus 3 uh, chapter 1, you can follow along in your app, your Bible, or on the screen behind me. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, 
to be peaceable and considerate and always be gent to be gentle toward everyone. And this feels kind of like a continuation of last week, a, a sort of a, a continued list of how we're supposed to live, that we're called to be ready to do what is good. And we see things like to slander no one. This list that I just read, like it's nothing new that we haven't heard before. He's just sort of reiterating. He's like, don't slander anyone. Not that that applies a whole lot to today, right? And so when he says don't slander anyone, I often hear people, yeah, yeah, but like it's a telemarketer. No one. I hear kids all the time, my teacher really stinks or whatever, right? Like, no, no one. What about the guy that cuts me off? He knew what he was doing. Okay, I'm going to keep saying this word. I don't think you know what it means. It means no one. <laughs> There's not like an exception clause. Be peaceable. Consider it always. That is an extreme word. Always gentle toward everyone. To everyone. Everyone. For repetition purposes. Everyone, church. And I confess that our inner heart, it can say, yeah, 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 but I'm picturing this person, and I really don't like them. And all jokes aside, they didn't cut me off. They hurt me. They hurt people I love. They're awful human beings. They're not contributing well to this world. I don't like them. Do you mean them, Jesus? And Jesus in our heart in the form of the Holy Spirit is saying, yes, everyone. And our inner heart says, but they don't deserve it. And Jesus goes, I know, that's the point of all of this, because neither did you, yet I gave it to you, and now it's your turn to give it to them. This isn't a deserve thing. None of you deserve any of this. You now get to be the hands and feet of me. You get to be on my, my team. You get to experience the wins that I get to experience. You were them, but now you're mine. And if your inner heart is just kind of saying, oh man, well, I was kind of just in this for me. That's not what I signed up for. Then I just ask you to admit it. It's okay for now. Just admit, man, that's just not where my heart was. It does mean you probably shouldn't be in leadership at a church at this moment. But it means you're still wrestling, and that's okay. You're wrestling with the truths of grace and mercy and forgiveness that Jesus offers. And the price that was paid for it, you're still trying to understand that. You're probably still wrestling with how your sin contributed to the death of Jesus. And if that's you, don't wait to meet to talk with someone. Don't, let it, don't go days without asking to talk to a pastor, to someone who gets this truth in your life. Don't leave here being okay with your bitterness and your anger. That is not what God wants for you. He wants to use you. He wants you to be better so that he can use you in amazing ways. And I'd be remiss if I skipped entirely over that first little section, that first sentence in the section we just read. That said, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities. Paul's writing to a young pastor. Therefore, he's writing to pastors. I'm supposed to tell you this. Hey, guys, remember that you're supposed to be subject to rulers and authorities. Even my rule? Yes, yes. You see, back then it was a lot worse than it is now. And God's saying you need to be subject to them. Now, I know that there's a whole lot of theology on this. And there's nuances to this. Like, I get it. You might say, well, okay, Nick, what about if, like, Nazis are looking for the Jewish people I'm hiding? Okay, you're going to do the extreme thing? You're going to use that as the disqualifier to, okay, well, I can rebe be rebellious in this one little area? To which I say, yeah, you could be, sweet, I can be rebellious in all of them. No, that's not how this works. The truth is, if we're being really honest, and I'm preaching at me right now, we are rebellious by nature. We have ultimately sinned and gone and rebelled against our great king of kings. And so it's very easy to go against my great governor of governors <laughs> or president of presidents, right? And he's reminding us that this isn't about obeying or kowtowing. It's about being a good witness. Stop having a rebellious nature. We have a people to reach out to, to shine for. And the more time we spend fighting authorities... The louder we are as we, and the louder that we are uh, as we scream at the rulers and politicians, the less time, arguably, we spend talking about Christ. And we usually share Christ less passionately. Have you ever noticed that? I know a lot of people, myself included, can get very loud about politics, issue, agenda. You want to come to church? Maybe learn about Jesus? I'm like, oh, 
I know what you're louder about. I know what you care more about. And that's what Paul is saying. Realize that that's just not the issue. And I want to simply leave you with this question. Has the church's witness, historically, has the church's witness improved the, improved the more political the church has gotten? Has the church's witness improved the more political that the church has gotten? And my argument is, not really. I mean, maybe in some aspects, but no, not really, not by and large. And if you say, yeah, I think the more political and loud I get, that, you know, the, the better the witness is. And I'm going to say, cool, Romans 14, disputable matter, agree to disagree. I disagree, and this church and the leadership isn't really going to support that. And if you feel that way, that's fine. You can think that, but that's not what you're going to hear preached. I'd rather err on the side of saying, by and large, we should be submitting to rulers and authorities. Heck, we just learned last week how slaves are supposed to be obedient to their masters. And if the answer is, is no, then that, that um, you're okay with following rulers and authorities, then just make sure that you continue to fall in the category of being eager to do what is good, eager to do good for the Lord, and not eager to fight for my political ideals. It's interesting when you go back and read Isaiah uh, 20 and 30, I think, those chapters, he talks about his people who keep going to the Egyptians for political and governmental protection and they keep like rooting for certain people to be uh, in charge. And they want to follow the government. The government is the answer. And God's like, you can wipe away all that thinking with a menstrual rag, he says. That's strong language. Sorry for the kids in the room, but you can skip over that part. But just in case the reader hasn't fully gotten the reason for why we do what we do, Paul so conveniently writes one of the best descriptions here in this next section of who we were, who we are, and what we, sh what we should do. And then the foundational why behind all of it. So if you're like, man, I just want to warn you. These guys always seem to bring it back to Jesus. I'm going to say you're right, but your issue isn't with us. It's with Paul because he keeps bringing it back to Jesus. It gets very repetitive. And I'll read straight through it, and then we'll break it down afterwards. Titus 3, 3 through 7. At one time, we too, who we were, were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our, our Savior appeared, he saved us who we are. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that, leading to something, who we should be, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy, trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Who were we? Well, it says we were enslaved. We were enslaved. We were captivated by we wanted to fo follow all the pleasures and passions of this world. And it's not a friendly description. You don't read this and you're like, yeah, we weren't so bad. You're like, ugh, it's not a great description. And so I ask, do you really believe and understand and know this in your life? That what we were is enslaved? That before Jesus and sadly sometimes even after we accept Jesus, we allow ourselves to be enslaved? We dumb it down a little bit where we're like, sometimes I just give in to temptations or I listen to the lesser angels of my nature. <laughs> we have ways of like making it okay. But what Paul's saying is like, man, when, when you give in to these things, you're allowing yourselves to be rechained, re-enslaved to these things. And again, as I always say, this is not to guilt us. It's good to reflect on these things, but not for the purpose of guilt, but instead the purpose of humility and understanding of patience and the ability to understand this so you can extend grace and mercy to others. Because I've been there, friend. I get it. I can't be mad at you. Otherwise, I'd have to be super mad at myself. I get it. You're just not there yet. And I confess, depending on the day or moment, I can even forget this. I call it the syndrome of I'm basically good syndrome. I'm basically good. The world's good at saying that. It's a cousin to the at least I'm not as bad as syndrome. And a relative to, it's not like I kicked a puppy, syndrome, <laughs> insert sin here, syndrome. The I'm basically good syndrome leads us to overindulgences, 
and addictions and fleshly pleasures. Sometimes it even, uh, it's, it even shows up in, in things that are kind of okay, but we rechain ourselves to like sports and vacations and TV and video games and cars and food and furniture and stuff. We overuse and self-medicate, and often we can catch the, I've earned this, it's been a hard week virus. Now, please hear me, I'm not a prude. Many of these things I list, like, I'm okay doing. But these things, while they can be a part of life, the truth is the number of times that I've seen over my almost two decades as of next year of being a pastor, the number of times I see people using these things and clinging to them as little S saviors and comfort bringers, well, man, it just makes sense why Paul is saying, don't be enslaved to these things. I know that it's what we lean on for comfort. We've been set free. And how? Well, he just said it. How are we set free? By God's mercy and grace. But what did it take? It took Jesus. It took his mercy. Verse 4, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done. Don't ever hear behavior modification here. But because of his mercy, and where did his mercy come from? What price was paid? He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. And now we're a new creation. We're something new. Our debt has been paid. We're free and clear. We're created. We are purposed to do a new thing. So that, we see that phrase a lot, having been justified by his grace, grace in us, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. And there's that phrase, stress these things. Stress what? Stress that we're saved by faith through grace because of the mercy of God and the sacrifice that Jesus made. That's what we're supposed to stress. And let me be clear, I love teaching on things like the Old Testament and history and theology and Psalms and songs in Hebrew and Greek and context History, those are fun stories, and I love doing all these things. But those things aren't what Paul just said to stress. I would love it. He said, stress context, because people might get confused. Like, sweet, I get to stress context. But if you're like, Nick, why do you and Andy, why do we keep stressing the gospel? Because um, Paul said to stress the gospel. <laughs> you, but you keep saying it over and over again. I know, and so does Paul. It's almost like we forget it. <laughs> Is it repetitive? Yes, but we're supposed to be repetitive. In this one book of Titus, a, a thousand and one words, 46 verses, um, I believe that's what it is, eight and a half minutes to read straight through, the, the phrase, so that, appears seven times conservatively. Probably more if you factor in things like, so now, do this, and other phrases like that. It's probably more, but at least seven times, so that, appears. Eight times the phrase doing good appears. That's about every six verses you're hearing, so that doing good, so that doing good. It's almost like God knows that we forget and we need to read it over and over and over. Anyone else forgetful from time to time? And so now that we get it, hopefully, Paul's like, okay, your followers, you get it, right? You know the why, you know what you were, you know what you are because of Jesus. Yes, I'm devoted, I'm following, I'm a follower. Paul gives us a warning. And like any good parent, I haven't crossed this bridge yet. Be praying for me. In four months, I might be crossing it. But like that first time you give your, your uh, car keys to the kid, you're like, all right, have fun. You don't just walk away. It's always, have fun. Be safe. Keep the, keep the radio down. Look out for red lights. Don't hit anyone. Those little warnings. I always love it when you get ready to travel home and people are like, travel safe. Like, oh, I almost forgot. Thanks. I was going to drive 85 through a school zone, but you re thanks for saying travel safe. But Paul gives a warning because he knows that we could be dumb teenagers that are a little older than teenage years. And he warns us, don't get tripped up. Now that you're following, here's what's going to trip you up. Verse 9. But avoid foolish controversies on Facebook. Ah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law. Because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a, dev a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful, 
They're self-condemned. Chalk one up for healthy boundaries, right? Avoid foolish controversies. And this is where I have to confess, oh man, I didn't want to read that. I'm an opinionated person and I'm talkative and that's a bad combination. Here's a list of the foolish things as I was getting a little prideful this week. Like, yeah, Lord, you need, you need me to say this. and it really gets people changing. The Lord's like, you totally need to say that, but first you need to check yourself. And I said, well, reveal to me, like, what have I, what kind of foolish controversies have I gotten into? And the Lord's like, oh, here, remember these? And within about seven seconds, this is what I wrote down. I have literally found myself in the middle of an argument going, why am I arguing about this? And even worse, why do I continue arguing about this? To the point to where, like, it's awkward with people, where afterwards I'm like, I'm sorry, I was just way too passionate sounding about the topic of pineapple on pizza. I'm so, I don't know why. Bigfoot, the moon landing, who would win in a fight, a bear versus a gorilla, jujitsu versus kung fu. I'm not making this up. I've done this. Some of you, like, I remember that. It was awkward. Sports rules, the best superpower. Literally, I'm like, no, sir, you're wrong. It's this imaginary superpower. I mean, just with Andy alone, I've argued about cricket versus football, America versus England, and how to pronounce the word aluminum. <laughs> Aluminium. Whatever. You stop adding U's to words. It's pointless. Paul is warning us not to continue on with foolish controversies, especially with the things that are already settled, like the law. Right? When, when people then are like, well, the law can save us. Paul's like, no, it can't. I mean, it's one thing to argue about silly, foolish things, but about things that are already settled, it's pointless. You can't be saved by the law, so stop arguing about it. You're just giving them a voice. It's unprofitable and useless. Just walk away, Nick. Some of us need to recognize when to stop arguing and just walk away and say, okay, I agree to disagree. I think you're wrong, but I can't stop you. You've heard the truth, and now, like I was presented with truth one day, and I had to decide, you do too. But I'm not going to keep doing this because it's going to hurt my witness. I have lives to go do good to. Grace in me, good through me, go to be a blessing and pray people see Jesus. But what I don't want them seeing is this, this argument. Put the keyboard down. The truth is, all I have to do is say certain trigger words in a room this big, and statistically speaking, I can make the, the um, blood pressure rise in the room. Delta, Omicron, masks, lockdowns, elections, Fox News, MSNBC, the CDC, the science. And you're like, man, I've had eight conversations about four of those words in this last week. I'm like, that could be a problem. I'm confessing here. I've spent less time talking about Jesus than I have about Omicron. That could be a problem. In church, I just want to say, I think Paul's warning us not to fall into this trap of foolish controversies. Yes, they can be important, but we need to be careful not to make them more important than Jesus. Keep in mind that Jesus could have come and addressed all the issues of the day, but he didn't. They even tried. What do you think about taxes, Jesus? We don't worry about taxes here, right? But back then, there was this thing called taxes, that people didn't like. I know, foreign concept. And they tried to ask him about taxes. He's like, look, let me just pull a coin out of this magic fish that I have pull it, right? And like totally changed the subject. He could have spoken about an issue. He did it because he had bigger issue. He had, no pun intended, bigger fish to fry. He couldn't fix the government, so he was coming to fix the individual because the real issue with humanity was each and every individual person's sin issue. And he came for each and every individual person's sin issue, not to establish a certain type of of government. He wanted us to be a people filled with grace, ready to do good, to be a witness for him, first and foremost. And when we fail to avoid foolish controversies, we become fools in controversy. We become divisive. And remember what Paul just said about divisive people, especially unnecessarily divisive people. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time, and after that have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful and are self-condemned. They're warped and sinful and self-condemned. They're warped because they're arguing the wrong things. In Scripture, we know that at the time there were people called the Judaizers. They were Jews that were Christians now. So we're not talking about them outside of us. We're talking about within us. Christians who were like, well, I was Jewish, but now I'm a Christian. And Gentiles were like, I want to skip the line and become a Christian too. Oh, but we had to do it the hard way. We had to be Jews first. We had to follow a lot of really hard laws and then accept Jesus. That's too easy for you. And the Gentiles are like, well, we're okay with it if you are. And like, we're not okay with it. 
You have to become Jewish first, and then you can be one of us. Oh, sweet. What do we have to do? Well, there's this thing called circumcision. I'm out. They were called the Judaizers, people who were arguing about the law to save you. And I believe today that we can argue about almost anything, even within the church. And let me be clear, there are things worth dividing over, but how we do it matters. It's not loud and, and, and mean-spirited. We warn once, we warn twice, and then we walk away. We don't complain to others. We don't argue. We don't post Facebook reviews telling others. We don't relive it in our head like, ooh, I should have said this. And we don't stay bitter. We don't need to condemn others. They're self-condemned, the Bible says. Let God do that, not us. It means that they're self-condemned because while they're trying to divide the body of Christ, Christ is like, you can't divide the body of Christ because the body of Christ is meant to be united. So if you're dividing the body of Christ, you're working against the logic that I gave you. It just doesn't hold up. More times than not, though, if we're going to be really honest, the reason that we and others argue like we do is because we just want things our way. I want my comfort. I want my peace. I want my pleasure in life. It rarely has to do with like, I really just think this is how things should be because I like it that way. <laughs> it's usually how it goes. And as a friendly reminder, reminder, we aren't promised comfort and pleasure in this life. I wish we were. We're promised eternity. We're promised the Holy Spirit to live in us and to give us strength to do these hard things. We're promised that we are heirs to God. We're his family we're promised that we now have the ability to do good, but as we learned last week, that good is meant to bless and influence others. It's not meant to just bless us. You read these three chapters of Titus, and you'll find that six out of the seven so that's are meant so that we can positively influence others, that we, Christians, can positively influence others. And what about that seventh one? Well, it's actually about Jesus' grace positively influencing us so there, in fact, all seven of the so that's are an extension of grace to produce good and blessing to others, not self. And Paul closes with the personal message. Verses 12 and 13, he's talking specifically to a couple guys, talking about where he's going to go for the winter. But then he concludes with this, verse 14. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order so that in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith and grace be with you all. So the overall theme of the book of Titus is that we're rooted in Jesus. That's the foundation. It doesn't start with our good works. It starts with Jesus. Then we can have grace in us to produce good through us so that others can receive that grace and produce good through them because they're rooted in Jesus. You remember our Setting the Bar series? I think we started it outside. For those of you that were here back in the middle of last year, then we moved inside, we had the bar. Do you remember how I started every sermon off as a, as a flashback? We had a bar. It looked like a high jump bar. And do you remember where the bar was set at the beginning, beginning of every service? Where was it? It was about this high. And what did I do at the beginning of every service? I actually put it down low. You remember that? Because the, service wasn't, the, the sermon series wasn't called Raising the Bar. It was called setting it. Jesus raised the bar. Like, he set the bar for Our bar is actually set extraordinarily low. He's like, I want you to do the very ordinary things, but regularly, day in and day out, faithfully, loving God and loving, or, loving others. Followers are told to do the simple, but to do it faithfully, daily. And the truth is, on our own power, we can't even do that. And that's humbling. I could jump over that bar. Cool, do it a million times. What? I'm going to get a cramp. God's like, I know you can't even do the simple on your own power, and that's okay, but that's what I want you to realize because I'm going to help you do that simple thing faithfully. And I can't help but think of, of Peter, like one of Jesus' closest friends. I love Peter because I so identify with him. That guy that like leaps before he looks sometimes and then kind of looks dumb in front of everybody. I've never happened to me. <laughs> Laptop, keep that in mind. One minute, he's calling Jesus the Messiah. And Jesus is like, you're the first to acknowledge this, Peter. And the next Peter's like, well, we can't have you go to Jerusalem. And he's like, behind me, Satan. Like, oh, man, that de-escalated quickly. One minute, he's walking on water. And the next, he's drowning because he took his eyes off Jesus. One minute, he's at the transfiguration, seeing Jesus and Moses and Elijah. And he's like, this is so good. We've got to keep this going forever. Can I build tents? And like, Jesus doesn't even talk to him. He's like, that's not what we're here for. 
One minute, he's chopping off ears trying to defend Jesus. Like, boom, cuts off the soldier's ear. Jesus is like, stop it. Those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. Peter, sorry about my boy Pete. Here, let me fix that for you. Poor Pete. He's trying to do the extraordinary constantly. I mean, it's a noble effort, but he's missing what Jesus is saying. Jesus is like, look, I need you to do the simple and do it well. Stay focused on that. Live at peace. Do good for others with this new life that I've given you by giving my life. That's your purpose. Don't deny me. Follow me. And Peter's like, okay, I got this. I'll never deny you. I might be quick and foolish and, and, and do all these other things, but Jesus, I will never deny you. And Jesus is like, oh, Peter, you're living on your own power again. Not only are you going to deny me, you're going to deny me not once, not twice, but three times. I'll never deny you. And then it happened. A servant girl, the high priest, probably junior high age, she saw him. She said, you also were with that Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it. And he responded, I don't know or understand what you're talking about. And then he left and went into the entryway. But that same servant girl saw him there and she said, this fellow is one of them. And again, he denied it. Then a little while later, some people, they saw him and they said, surely you're one of them. You're a Galilean. And he responded by calling down curses and swearing at them, saying, I don't know this man you're talking about. Oh, Pete, a wonderful man who tried to do more than what Jesus was asking him. But he was trying to do it on his own strength. He was missing that. He couldn't even do the most basic thing on his own strength. And I think we can all be a little or a lot like Peter. We get caught up in the, in the optics and the grandeur and what things could be. We dream of what can happen instead of slowly, instead of slowing down and asking God first, hey, what should happen? What would you have me do before I go have my plan? And here you have a picture of a broken man realizing that he stinks, like life really stinks for him. He can't do anything right. And where do we find him in his brokenness? He's back fishing again. You know where Jesus found him? going back to the familiar, going back to his old life, what was comfortable, saying, well, I can't do that anymore. I might as well just go back. And I want to encourage anyone that's struggling with anything not to go back to what's easy and comfortable in this world. It might be familiar, but it's not necessarily what God wants for you. And it's certainly not as good as Jesus. Those relationships that you know that you're not supposed to be a part of, those habits, those ways of coping and getting by, Please remember that Jesus wants you and can use you. But we have to do it his way and on his power. And look at Peter and his restoration. After Jesus is risen and revealed him to, he had revealed himself to some of the disciples slowly, Peter and the guys, they're out fishing. They're out in the boat. And Jesus comes up on the shore. And he's like, hey, you catching anything? And they're like, no. Throw the nets on the other side then. It's funny Jesus used to say that. Throw the nets over, and guess what happens? Full of fish, you know, just like what happened with oh, Jesus. And Peter's like, it's our Lord. And they're all excited. And the other guys grab their oars, and Peter just jumps out the boat, pulls a forest gump right off the dock, and starts going to Lieutenant Dan. Boom. The guys roll back, and he gets to shore. Like, oh, Jesus, there you are. Jesus got a fire going. He has this conversation with Peter, and the awkwardness had to be palpable because the last time he saw him, he had denied him three times after saying he wouldn't. And Jesus has this interaction with them. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. What did Jesus say for Peter to do with the grace that he's received? To do good for others. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Again, what's he supposed to do with the grace that he's received? Do good for others. And then a third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. It's repetitive, isn't it? Almost like we can forget. And sometimes it hurts to be humbled when we take our focus off of what's right and important. But God's not going to abandon us. He might correct us, and it might hurt, but it's good for us. 
And a third time, Jesus tells Peter that the grace in him is supposed to do good for others. It's not flashy, and it's not complicated. It's simple, and it's good. And Jesus concludes this interaction by telling Peter that, that doing this will lead to suffering and even death for him specifically. And then Jesus concludes with this. Then he said to him, follow me. Follow me. If you've been around the last year or so, you know that we've seen that phrase a lot. It's like when you discover a new car, then you see it everywhere. everywhere. That phrase, follow me, seems to pop up a lot. We say it a lot because it's there a lot. And you might recall from our Not a Fan series, our theme verse, Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. But instead, I think a lot of times, Jesus says, follow me. And we go, no, Jesus, you follow me. And that's the wrong direction. And so the question is, where are you when it comes to being a follower that the Lord can use? It's truly. I mean, we all need to wrestle with this individually. Are you still searching? If you are, then that's okay. Reach out. Are you nailing it? Are you like, I'm really following the Lord. Praise God for you. Keep it up. And if you need encouragement, let me know, and I'll cheerlead you on. Are you tripping up or missing the mark or feeling unworthy or, f or focusing on the wrong things? Well, then praise God for admitting it. Thank you for being honest with yourself. Now, now do what the James talks about and confess it to others. Be part of the body of Christ, the church family. Reach out to a pastor. Don't leave here feeling guilty. Guilt is not the goal. Growth towards Jesus is the goal. Jesus is the goal. Being a people filled with grace, doing good because... They're rooted in Jesus. That's the goal, and it takes a united community to do it. James 1.22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. May we be a people eager to do good for God's glory with the grace that he provides. Amen? That's the book of Titus. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for using <laughs> broken people that are messed up, but redeeming us, create, making us new creation, making us part of your story. Lord, I repent and apologize when I hijack your story and try and take it over and try and tell others how this should all go, and I get ahead of you instead of stopping and asking, what would you have me do? Lord, in the default moments of our life when we pray, what's the next thing for me? May we just default to doing good for others. May we be a blessing to others May we be caught being who we're called to be so that we can witness to others. And we praise you and thank you for those that witness to us. We're just part of a long story of a couple thousand years of followers of Christ. And we're grateful to be even just parts of that story, your story, your story of redemption and grace and mercy. Lord, let us remain rooted in you having grace in us, to produce good in us and a blessing to this world for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.